welcome to SGAC Japan Space Talk. Uh, the goal of this weekly webinar series is to spark the conversation about space among students and young professionals during quarantine. Uh, today, we welcome Elizabeth Tasker, Associate Professor at JAXA's uh, Institute of Space and Astronautical Science. Uh, she'll be talking to us about astrophysics. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Okay, so uh, just a quick uh, introduction of the format. Uh, Sam and I will talk to you in the first half hour, and we will spend the latter half hour on Q&A. So if you, the viewers, have questions or comments, please write them in the comment section, and uh, feel free to leave them during the first half hour as well. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so first, could you give us a quick self-introduction? Of course. So hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Tasker. Um, I am British by nationality, but I moved to Japan about 10 years ago. Uh, as a quick, rapid career overview, I originally studied physics as an undergraduate at the University of Durham in the UK, which is um, in the north of England, if you ignore Scotland. Just before you get to Scotland, you basically hit Durham. <laughs> it's famous for a huge cathedral and castle and has um, a strong science department, which is why I picked it. And then from there, I went to Oxford uh, in the south of England to do a PhD in computational astrophysics. So while I was at Durham, I realized that I had almost no skill whatsoever in laboratories. <laughs> so I tweaked my degree slightly to graduate in theoretical physics. And then from there, went to specialize in computer modeling. So in particular, my thesis looked at modeling galaxies in large scale computer simulations using one of the big hydrodynamics codes, which just solves uh, the equations for gas dynamics and particles to look at how systems evolve. Uh, and I spent, actually, the degree program in the UK is three years for the PhD, because we don't have a separate master's. Uh, but the third year of that, my supervisor moved to Columbia University in New York City. So I moved with him. So while I stayed officially registered at Oxford, I was physically in New York. And I spent two years there, one year finishing off my PhD, and then one further year really publishing my thesis, because one of the challenges with the British PhD system is you have just enough time to do the research, but not really enough time to get it in the journals. <laughs> uh -huh. So you don't have much proof that you've done the research. So fortunately, my supervisor had um, some grant money and he paid for me to stay on as a research assistant. And we basically published my thesis during that year. And then I moved down to Florida, University of Florida, because, you know, three years without a winter, I mean, who could resist that? Nobody. And I became their uh, postdoctoral fellow in theoretical astrophysics, which um, was a new post they set up to give uh, a postdoc position that had a bit more independence. So people may be familiar with postdocs, but basically they are short term between one and three year positions where you're a junior researcher, so you work under someone more senior, and the purpose is to gain experience of different research departments, different techniques and skills before you move on to faculty. And in astrophysics, especially theoretical astrophysics, uh, and a sort of ideal norm would be about six years postdoctoral research. Sometimes people do longer because they want to, sometimes they do it because obviously it's hard if the faculty jobs just aren't there the year you're ready uh, so sometimes there's there's some movement in there um, so I did three years at Florida and then after that I actually squeezed in a four-month fellowship in at the National Observatory in Taka in Tokyo and that was uh, the JSPS short-term fellowship so Japan Society Promotion of Science and I knew one of the researchers there we were working on very similar stuff and I asked, could I come to Japan for a short time just to see what it was like? And I really liked it. I had a great time at NAOJ. I really loved Tokyo. And I said at the end of my four months, could I come back? And they interestingly said to me, you can, but you probably have to come back again as a postdoc, not as faculty. Because they said at the time, so this was 2011, they said, Typically, faculty in Japanese universities, all the courses are taught in Japanese. And no one can afford to support a faculty member who can't teach. It's just too much pressure on the rest of the 
faculty because they have to do your teaching load as well. So it's very hard, therefore, to hire a foreigner as a foreign faculty member. So I said, well, you know, that's disappointing, but I understand. And I returned as planned to go to Canada uh, for Mac to McMaster University to do another sort of second proper postdoc there. And it, it got near the end of that time. I thought, I really want to go back to Japan. So everyone was like, you should apply for faculty jobs. And I was like, yes, I should. Or <laughs> I could do a third postdoc and go back to Japan. <laughs> So I was in the midst of deciding what was really sensible when actually I got an email from Hokkaido University to say that they were introducing more courses for their international students and they were actually looking to hire a faculty member in physics who would teach in English. So that bypassed the problem that I wouldn't be able to pull my weight in the department and I applied for that position and I got it. So after two years in Canada, I moved to Sapporo and I went to the University of Hokkaido and I took up a faculty job there. And I stayed at Hokkaido for five years, uh, working in the Department of Physics there. And then um, in, where are we now, 2020? So 20, 2018? <laughs> it's 2020. <laughs> yeah. So about three years ago, or three and a half years ago, um, I moved to JAXA. They were advertising for an associate professor position then, and I was just due for tenure at Hokkaido, so I was moving from assistant to associate. And I applied for that position. Now that was slightly interesting because uh, obviously JAXA's work is incredible. I mean, they build rockets, who wouldn't love that? But my work was theoretical astrophysics. It wasn't a very close match with any particular JAXA mission. So I emailed them and I said, you know, you've got this opening. Um, I'm the right level, but I'm not an obvious fit. I said, however, I noticed that you still do a lot more outreach in uh, Japanese than you do in English. And currently, in my opinion, you're running some of the most exciting missions in the world. Will you let me come down and help with the English outreach? And that will be my main fit with JAXA. And I didn't know whether they would go for that. That wasn't what they'd advertised. They'd advertised for a regular research position. They hadn't mentioned science communication. But I emailed um, Mitsuda-san down there and he wrote back and said, we're interested, send us your application. So I sent the application and they interviewed me and I explained my experience as a science researcher as well as a science communicator. So by that stage, I'd, done, um, I'd written for several magazines like Scientific American, Astronomy Now, and a lot of the media on just scientific discoveries, especially astrophysics, because obviously that was my area. But I'd also helped start up a research blog at Hokkaido where I'd gone around different departments and written about their work. So I was starting to build up a portfolio. And then um, just before starting at JAXA, I was contacted by Bloomsbury Publishing House. They're famous for publishing the Harry Potter books. So they're a very big international publishing house. And they said, would you be interested in pitching a science book to us? Uh, so I did. I said, I want to write about planet formation. and um, about six months after I started at JAXA, the book came out. So when I was applying, the book was definitely on the way. It was in the pipeline. So I, I was able to list that as an example of science communication. Is that the Planet Factory? That is. I have a copy. Oh, wow. Over here somewhere. <laughs> there we go. This one. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So this was on uh, Planet Formation. I'm happy to answer more questions if people want to know about the process. Um, so anyway, the point was I applied to JAXA and said, you did not ask for this, but I would really like to help with your science communication. And I promise I'm a reasonable scientist as well. And they said, okay, <laughs> we're sold. So I started at JAXA um, that October after the semester ended at Hokkaido. And um, I do there a mixture of my science research program in star and planet formation. And I also help with different missions to help their English outreach, uh, translating from the Japanese with a lot of help from Google Translate and sometimes producing original content in English, which is then back transferred into Japanese. So we try and do uh, bilingual outreach where possible, especially for the Hayabusa 2 mission and for the new Martian moon exploration mission. And also really for anything anyone wants me for. So that's a bit of a rambly talk and I can clarify any part that people are interested in, but that's where we are now. Right, thank you. Um, this is a question that we ask every guest is, um, in your upbringing, what sparked your first interest in space? 
So actually for a very long time, I wanted to be a veterinary surgeon. Um, this was completely ridiculous because I have no skill in biology and I'm not even really that interested. But, you know, you have a childhood dream and you kind of lock onto it and decide, no, this is, this is the decision I've made. I'm going to be a vet. So I was very inspired as a child by a series of books written by someone called James Herriot. And in these books, they're taken, they're based on true stories, though I suspect with quite a lot of exaggeration, about a countryside vet who goes around and um, most of his clients are farmers. So he drives around the Yorkshire Moors rescuing cows in labour and various things like that. And I was sure this is what, hello, Thomas, <laughs> that this is what I wanted to do. And then when I was 13, the school gave us all a big careers test. And this was one of these very detailed tests where they try and test your abilities without, uh, there's no obvious right answer to the questions is what I'm saying. They're things like, here is a shape, please tell us which of these other shapes matches it. And you have to mentally turn them around in your head and it tests things like 3D visualization. And at the end of the test, you never have any idea how you did. It's one of those tests. And I did this whole thing with my classmates. And then we all had individual interviews with a careers expert. And she sat down and she said, Elizabeth, you say you want to be a vet, but all your skills are in physics and maths. <laughs> and actually all your interests are in astronomy and writing. <laughs> <laughs> Would you consider rethinking your career path? <laughs> and of course, once that was laid out, she was completely right. I mean, I was, you know, obviously living with my parents and in my bedroom there was this huge picture of Saturn on my wall uh, for my birthday when I was eight or nine I asked to be taken to the London Planetarium so I don't know why I still wanted to be a vet because it was very obvious I wasn't interested in that at all <laughs> um, so I would say that my interest was started when I was quite young when I was eight or nine and I visited the planetarium and I had this very immersive experience where you see the planets of the solar system and I remember thinking, it's amazing, we're sitting here now, it's a normal London street, but out there, there is this huge gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, and they're there all the time, you just can't see them most of the time. And I find that quite inspiring and also, you know, I really wanted to know more about them. And then it wasn't really till I was 13 or 14 when I got some proper careers advice. And it was suggested that maybe I wanted to do this as a career and not just a hobby. <laughs> that I started to more seriously think about physics. And then um, in the UK, you sit two sets of school examinations. You sit what we call GCSEs at 16. And these are on a broad range of subjects from English, science, languages across the board. And then when you're 17 and 18 years old, you specialize in just two or three subjects. So at that point, I did physics, chemistry, and mathematics. And I applied for straight physics at university because I felt that Although I knew I was very interested in astronomy, astronomy is one of the areas that's very easy to publicize. So maybe there were other areas of physics that were just as fascinating that people just hadn't really had access to when you're at school. So I went in sort of more open minded and thought maybe I'll find something more interesting. It turns out there is nothing more interesting. Uh, astronomy really is <laughs> the most exciting aspect of that. And so when I went into my fourth year, I decided that I was going to do the PhD and it was going to be in astrophysics. Uh, but I wasn't very good with the practical side of science. So I decided telescopes weren't really going to be for me. So computer models were what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, then, so then I applied for my PhD. Now, at the time I was interested in planet formation, but planet formation is still quite a new field. We only found the first exoplanets in the early 1990s. And this was only sort of 10 years or so beyond that stage. So there was some planet formation being done in the UK, but not a huge amount. The UK was much more better known for star and galaxy formation. And the big computer simulations, which is what I was really excited by, were mainly in the area of galaxy and star formation. So I initially didn't do planets at all. I did galaxy formation. And I became trained as a um, computer simulator, which I loved. And it wasn't until later that um, I started to realize I was still very, very interested in planets and I wanted to kind of slide across. But it's also very hard to do that when you're more senior because you have students and you can't risk giving them a project that won't work out. 
So for a while, I felt a little bit trapped, like I enjoyed the galaxy work, but I wanted to explore planets, but I wasn't sure how to make that transition. And around that time, that was when Bloomsbury contacted me and said, would you be interested in writing a science book? And I said, oh, yes. And they said, do you want to write about galaxies? And I said, no, <laughs> I'm done with galaxies. I don't want to write about them. I want to write you a book on planets. And they said, OK. And that gave me the push I needed to catch up on the literature, to read a lot of research papers. And as I started to write more and more about planets, I was able to also start to push my research across into planet formation because my knowledge of the area was also rapidly growing as I wrote about the topic. Right, so I want to talk a little bit more about planets. Um, in astrophysics, what uh, properties of planets are studied? Like, is it mass, density, composition? So the shocking thing is, is how little we can currently find out about an exoplanet. Obviously, for the planets of our solar system, we know a huge amount because we can visit. But when you are looking at a planet around a nearby star, you typically see them as shadows. So the most common way to find a planet is something called the transit technique, where the planet moves if there's a star, the planet's passing in front of it. And it causes a very small drop in the light you can see from the star because it's being slightly obscured by that planet. But all that tells you is the planet's radius. It doesn't tell you anything else. Now there's another technique where the planet's gravitational pull can be measured, which because it causes the star to wobble very slightly. And that's called the radial velocity technique. And that gives you the minimum mass of the planet. If you can measure the planet through both techniques, you can get the minimum mass and the radius. And actually from that, you can get the true mass. So that can give you a density. But that still doesn't tell you a great deal. I mean, as a guide, Venus and the Earth are very, very similar in size and mass. So they would be considered almost twins if we saw them around another star. But we've been to the surface of Venus and we can absolutely assure you <laughs> that it is not an Earth-like environment <laughs> in the slightest. The longest anything has survived on the Venetian surface is less than two hours and then it just melts the spacecraft. So the atmosphere is really important and that is going to be where the next generation of telescopes is going to focus. So at the moment, you're absolutely right. It's radius, mass, and if you're lucky to get both, density, uh, and nothing else. But new telescopes, for instance, the Webb Space Telescope that will hopefully launch in the next few years, and um, a number of other projects that are coming to fruition, will try and measure the planet's atmosphere. And the main way to do that is that as that planet passes in front of the star, a little bit of that starlight will pass through the planet's atmosphere. And as it does, different molecules in the atmosphere will absorb that light. So if you look at the light at different wavelengths, the planet will appear to change size very slightly, depending on if the atmosphere is absorbing that particular wavelength. And that's called transmission spectroscopy. And based on what wavelengths are effectively missing because they've been absorbed, you can get an idea of what's in a planet's atmosphere. And that can tell us vastly more about the planets. There's still quite a lot of modeling there because it just tells you about that top layer. It doesn't tell you about the surface, but it's the first indication of what the planet's really made of. So that's, that's going to be a really exciting step forward. I think it's going to take us really from one era of planet discovery to a new era of planet characterization, where we actually start to ask, what are these worlds made of? And could any of them actually be habitable? Right. Um, speaking of the um, more uh, detailed characteristics of planets, in our solar system, we kind of have an idea or we think we have an idea of the composition of the planets. Uh, how do you research that? So the simplest way is you can bring back a sample and look at it in the laboratory. <laughs> mm. Now, in practice, we haven't done this um, from any other planetary bodies apart from the moon so far. But uh, we have done it from asteroids, of course, with Hayabusa 1. And we have also visited the planets and done what we would call in situ analysis, where you can examine the rocks just locally with that rover or with a spacecraft from above and look at the different elements. For instance, you can use something called a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. And that looks at um, high energy particles scattered from the planet's surface. And that 
if you know more about experiments, as we clarified, I do not know very much about experiments. My understanding is that information tells you about the elements that compose of that planet. And likewise, reflected light, uh, because you're absorbing some wavelengths, you can find out about the molecules and minerals that are part of that planet's surface. And nothing really beats a sample return, though. I mean, these, these instruments are incredible, and sample return is very difficult. So most times you have to do this in situ analysis. But if you bring back a sample, you can keep analysing it. So there were papers released only last year on the sample brought back from Hayabusa. And if you consider the fact that the sample was really just tiny grains that clung to the inside of that sample container, the fact that years later, really 10 years later, we can still be analysing and learning about what asteroids are made of tells you how valuable sample return is. And indeed, the Apollo samples brought back from the moon landings have been analysed for things we never thought to look for at the time by instruments that weren't yet built, by scientists that weren't yet born. So sample return is the gift that keeps giving. So that would be, ideally, you bring back a sample from everywhere. In, in practice, you have to pick and choose a bit. <laughs> so um, in your research about exoplanets, uh, I, real, I noticed that you do mass estimation of exoplanets using neural networks. Um, yes. Could you talk a little bit more about um, that research, how um, the properties that are used to determine the mass, uh, how do you verify that, etc.? Absolutely. That was perhaps one of my most exciting research projects because I didn't know if it was going to work at the time when I went into it. Now, of course, for research, one technically never knows that, but this was something really quite different from what I'd done before. And I worked with a group at the Earth Life Sciences Institute, uh, which is on the Tokyo Tech campus. And LC, for short, is designed to be a multidisciplinary institute. So the idea is rather than saying, OK, you're a physicist, I'm going to put you in a department of physicists and you're going to do physicist problems. They say instead, let's take the problem and bring together different expertise that are associated with that problem. So for LC, that problem is the origin of life. How did life begin? And they bring together you know, physicists who look at planet formation. They bring together biologists and chemists who look at you know, test tubes full of uh, reactions of how you might go from an inorganic substance to something that might start to resemble an organic cell. Um, they bring together also artificial life people to understand intelligence from a more top-down perspective. And it was in that group of people that this idea came up. The, um, one of my colleagues, Nicholas Gutenberg, is an expert in neural networks. And uh, him, together with um, a planetary scientist, Mathieu Laneville, we talked about trying to fill in missing properties. So the problem we were tackling was that sometimes you actually can't measure a property of an exoplanet. So for example, I mentioned the two techniques, that slight light dimming from the transit and the wobble from the planet's gravity that together can give you mass and radius. But for example, if your planet orbits further from the star, like the Earth does, the probability of being able to observe it crossing the star's surface becomes incredibly small. Like for an Earth analogue, that is an Earth-sized planet around a sun orbiting at what we say 1 AU, our distance from the sun, the probability is less than half a percent half a percent that we would see that transit just because any very slight tilt at that stage would mean that from our view it doesn't cross the star and the mass is also equally difficult to measure because you have this tiny tiny wobble due to the planet but a star has a very cantankerous atmosphere it has its own waves and pulsations and vibrations and guess what those look just like planets <laughs> So sometimes the star is just too noisy to you to be certain you could pick out that planet's signature. And the problem can't be solved with more observations. Like if the planet doesn't transit, it doesn't transit. So how do you estimate the mass or radius? Now, people have been trying to do this for a while and typically they just use one property. They say, well, look, if we know the radius, we can maybe make a guess and say at that size, we expect the planet to be rocky. Therefore, we would expect this mass or, oh, it's quite large, maybe more than one and a half times the Earth's radius. Therefore, we're starting to think we get a thick atmosphere that will lower the relative mass. And you can make this 1D correlation. But 1D isn't great. So we thought about using neural networks because one of their strengths is they can find patterns when the dimensions are not just one or two. 
they don't neural network doesn't really care you can give it data that has really as many properties as you like and say find those patterns so this has been used a lot in image processing and also in science data including atmospheres and planets to try and find like that dip in starlight where you have a very noisy star and it's tried to pick out the dip that's the planet uh, but this was i think the first time we'd used it to give it the catalog and say okay i'm going to give you a batch of planets they've got mass they've got radius they've got orbital period they have an effective temperature and i'm going to give you the number of planets in the system and the stellar mass so six properties and we were able to find about 500 planets that had all six of those properties and we said to the neural network find the links between all these properties so it, it develops for itself an immensely complicated multi-dimensional function but once you have that you can then say okay I'm going to give you a new planet that doesn't have mass, but it has the other properties. So you tell me what the mass is to be consistent with what you've already found. So it's a little like having a density distribution, but in lots of dimensions. And I want you to pick me out a mass value that keeps it within that density distribution. So it's consistent with the other planets that you've learned. And what the network can do is it can give you not just one value, but actually a distribution of values. And it can say my best guess would be the mean of that distribution. But, and that's very useful, but it can also tell you more, like for instance, supposing that mass distribution had two bumps in it. What the network is saying is, based on your radius, your orbital period, your temperature, your stellar mass, and a number of planets in the system, there's two almost equally likely masses this planet could be. And that's quite exciting information, because it tells you that in that sort of parameter space, you have two different planet types. And you can use that to understand your theories of planet formation because they need to be able to explain why you could have a radius measurement but two different mass measurements for instance uh, so there's quite a lot of information there it's not it, it's not a th there's errors <laughs> that's what i'm saying it's an estimate it's not a final answer but there's information there that you can not easily extract through a normal one-dimensional graph and that you could use in planet formation theories and observations to understand how planets are formed and made. So that was that was our idea. Wow. Is, oh, sorry, can I jump in? Is there a reason that you've chosen like neural networks? Like, you know, there's there are a lot of types of machine learning um, wild methods. Like, is there a reason you've chosen that specific um, method? Um, yes and no. Uh, neural networks are very, very good at dealing with messy data where it's multi-dimensional. And you don't need any assumptions in at the beginning. For instance, there's Bayesian techniques, which have also been used extensively and very successfully in this kind of task. But the strength and weakness of Bayesian is you do have to give it some assumptions up front. So that can be, if your assumptions are correct, that's very helpful because it guides the machine learning to find a really good answer. But one thing Planet Formation has told us is your assumptions are not going to be correct. <laughs> Every time we think we understand planet formation, there's a surprise. I mean, the first exoplanet we discovered around a star that was similar to our sun is 51 Pegasi B. And that was a Jupiter with an orbit shorter than that of Mercury. And all of our planet formation theories until that point said that was impossible. You cannot form a gas giant so close to the star. And those sort of surprises just keep happening. We have to keep changing our theories. So while I would say if your assumptions are correct, I think I would expect a Bayesian technique to outperform us. If your assumptions are wrong, the Bayesian technique will also produce a wrong result. So the neural network is a way of saying, I'm not going to give you any assumptions. I'm going to give you the raw data. So the results I produce are purely based on what we've observed. The disadvantage with that is that all observations have biases. Telescopes have limits, for example. And those biases will be transmitted through the neural network because it has no way of knowing about them. But it's almost a sanity check. It says, you know, your theory needs to support the observational evidence. And what I'm going to produce for you is purely based on the observational evidence. So if there's a difference, you need to explain it because the observations tell you this. Uh, but I would say that you should never use these techniques alone. Uh, machine learning does have a lot of variety of techniques. They all have slightly different strengths and weaknesses. And if you're trying to find a real answer, I think you need to use all of them. You need to have a big toolbox. 
and you need to understand why they're different. When you understand why they're different, I think you have a theory. Right. Um, so we would like to uh, move on to the Q&A session. Um, it was um, really exciting to talk about all these things, but uh, we would like to uh, move on. Um, so if the viewers uh, would like to ask a question to Elizabeth, please leave them in the comments and uh, Sam will read them out to you. All right, um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, so the first question is, um, so are there some possible new ways to observe planets uh, that might move to, re to the research forward, to, to move the research forward? I mean, absolutely. Uh, there's techniques that we know about, but we just don't really have the instruments yet to see as much as is out there. I mean, the transmission spectroscopy I mentioned is still in its infancy. It's largely been done for gas giants, but the new instruments that are up and coming, including the Webb Telescope, uh, WFIRST, and also ground-based instruments, will start to be able to observe smaller and smaller planets and be able to find out more about their atmospheres. And that tells you so much more than just their mass and radius. Also direct imaging. Currently, to see a planet directly, it has to be quite a long way from its star. Otherwise, the starlight overwhelms it. But we're getting better and better at blocking out starlight through techniques such as shields or chronographs. And indeed, um, the Subaru telescope, Japan's Subaru telescope, which is in Hawaii, has um, done a lot of directly observing distant exoplanets. And advances on Subaru and other telescopes have allowed us to get more and more sensitive to that. And that allows you to both see the planet directly, which is always fun, but as you get better telescopes on these objects, you can also start to do the same kind of transmission spectroscopy. This time though, the light is coming directly from the planet. If you can split that up into wavelengths, you can also find out about its composition. So these techniques, I think over the next decade or 10 to 20 years, are going to take us from gas giants like Jupiter, which I don't mean to suggest at all are not exciting, they're very exciting, but let's face it, we all want to see what a rocky planet is like. So they will take us down in size to sort of super Earths and then eventually something more Earth sized. And I'm very excited about this. I mean, obviously astrobiology is amazing, but in some ways I would like to see how different a rocky planet could be. Like we have Earth and Venus, they're the same size, but they're wildly different and we still don't really understand why. And these were formed in the same solar system. So I would be really excited to see how diverse a rocky planet really could be. Would you have the same rocks as on Earth? Would you still have volcanic activity? Would you have plate tectonics? Or would you have something that's mainly composed of, for instance, ices where the volcanoes spew ammonia? Those sort of things I think would be something really exotic. That's what I'd like to see. Thank you. Um, so let's go to the next question. Um, what kind of spacecraft projects or science missions do you want to organize if you have enough funding to do? <laughs> You're going to give me an infinite budget? Well, now we're talking well. <laughs> I mean, um, the, the projects that JAXA is currently working on, JAXA's speciality is sample return and it's invaluable. I mean, it really is. They're very engineeringly challenging projects, but I would one of my goals in my personal career, I think, would be to try and merge planetary science and exoplanet science. Until recently, exoplanets has been the subject of astrophysicists rather than planetary scientists. And that's because we see these objects as shadows interfering with their star, which is what astronomers know about. But as we start to get atmospheric data, we have to consider the planet as not a dead ball that's blocking out light, but as something that maybe not living in the sense of life, but certainly dynamic with a sense of geological processes and you know, volcanoes and like I say, plate tectonics. And at that point, it becomes planetary science and we need to compare with the planets of our solar system. So I'm really interested in projects that try and merge these two disciplines because we desperately need one another. So understanding how our own solar system formed in more detail, I think is very important, like understanding how the earth became habitable. And in particular, my interest in that would be how much did our solar system architecture affect that? For example, one of the main theories is the earth formed dry without any water. 
and that water was delivered from icy meteorites that were scattered in from where they formed quite far out from the sun. And Hayabusa 2 and the Martian Moon Exploration Mission will be looking specifically at that problem. But if that's true, does that mean you need to have a Jupiter in your system? Because Jupiter both blocked some of the traffic coming our way, but it also scattered in those icy meteorites. So if you don't have a Jupiter, do you not have a water delivery surface? And I think planetary science missions can help answer that question. And that means when we look at exoplanet systems, we can be looking for maybe rocky planets with a more distant gas giant that might be needed for that water delivery. And I think that would be really exciting. So ideal missions, I would be on the same path as JAXA, but maybe, you know, I don't know, another 10 Hayabusa 2s. I'd really like to get some sampling in of those asteroids. So sure, we've got a couple, but imagine if we had hundreds. I mean, you could really start to get some statistics going on those asteroids. That'd be great. Um, I'd like to look more at the small bodies. So MMX is going to Phobos. Um, I think these small moons are carrying a lot of information about how our solar system was formed. So looking at these and looking at, you know, some of the smaller moons of Jupiter and Saturn would be really exciting. And then combined with that, getting this atmospheric data for those exoplanets. So, you know, we have the JWST, the Webb's telescope coming up. Another couple of those would be quite handy. <laughs> Maybe an even bigger mirror for Subaru to really try and get that atmospheric data in and not just measure it for one or two planets like Webb with a push could maybe do one or two rocky sized planets and it's going to be absolutely the edge of what it can do. If you want to look at the next generation of telescopes that might have a mirror two or three times the size and start to get a survey in that looks at you know 10 or 100 rocky planets, that's not going to happen particularly soon but if you give me an infinite budget <laughs> then you know maybe we could get it launched in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I think that time is coming. I don't think I'm proposing anything that won't be done but a bit of patience is maybe needed. Thank you. Um, so the next question is how, uh, yeah, okay. uh, how do you verify the new neural networks results of the mass estimation? So first of all, when we train it on this 500 set of planets, we hold some back. So we have, um, I can't remember how many used 50 or hundred planets that were not part of that training set, but we did secretly know their mass and radius. So then once we train the neural network and it said, yes, I have you a formula for deriving all these properties, we would say, okay, we're going to give you a planet without a mass, but we secretly did know the mass. <laughs> and so we would ask the neural network, make your best prediction. And then we would compare it with the actual known prediction. And the range of planets we held back had, you know, a range of masses from a Jupiter size through to a sort of earth sized. And we could see how it performed over each of those areas. And, you know, it's not bang on, we're talking a factor of two or so, um, but that's a lot better than randomly guessing. So it's, uh, it's definitely useful and it was promising. Also with neural networks, the more data you have, the better the network will do. So as we get more data from these, these observations, even though we can't get to the point where the network won't be needed, we can improve the network with every single observation. So that's really good too. Um, before I go to the next question, I actually had a question um, in words of the mass of the planet. You mentioned, you know, you, with the current technology or method that we have, you can measure the minimum mass of that, uh, you know, you can measure the minimum mass. Minimum mass. What is, what actually is a minimum mass? Like, oh, like, yeah. yeah. It's, um, the issue is you don't know the orbital orientation. So if I have a star here and I have a planet going around, if you're looking edge on, then you will measure the true mass of the planet. And the reason for that is you're trying to measure that tiny wobble in the star motion. And, but you can only measure the component that is directly towards you, the radial component, we would say. So if you're edge on, the planet is pulling the star directly towards you. So you measure 100% of that motion, you get 100% of the mass, it's no problem. If, however, rather than orbiting exactly in plane, your orbit is tilted, you're actually only going to see part of that motion. So part of the motion will be towards you, but part of the motion will be away from you and you'll miss this part of the motion. So as a result, you underestimate how much the star is moving in response to the planet. 
and therefore you underestimate the planet's mass. So that's why you get a minimum. Now, if you also measure the planet's transit, so you see it across the star's surface, you actually know the inclination of the orbit. So at that point, you know what fraction of the mass you're measuring. So you can turn that minimum into a true mass. Thanks. Um, OK, so the next question is, I read that there is a new theory on the formation of galaxies. Could you explain the existing, existing and the new theory uh, and what do you think is true? I actually don't know what the two competing theories are. So I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> I can give you an overview of roughly how galaxies form, but I'm not sure where the controversy is. So generally speaking, um, you, to really, really form a galaxy if you want to, you have to go back to the beginning, where I'm talking shortly after the Big Bang. And at that point, the universe is sort of this fog of um, atoms that are just starting to form. But it's not a completely homogeneous fog. It's not completely even. And because there are some density bumps, those start to draw in more and more mass as they gravitationally collapse. And it's these that form your first galaxies. But the universe is, is not a quiet place. It's a pretty violent place. So even while you form these first structures, they themselves will pull on each other and collide. And so you get later generations of galaxies forming from colliding old galaxies. And indeed, the Milky Way will eventually collide with the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, but not soon, no one should worry about it too much, uh, because gravity just always acts um, and gen generally pulls things towards each other. So that's the, that's the overall picture of how galaxies form. There are always people arguing about, you know, what, what shape the galaxies come out of from these interactions and, you know, what role, for instance, the star feedback plays. So stars can go supernova, they emit heat. There's also, um, normally a supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy, and that can cause a lot of energy injection into the galaxy. So people, the main debates over galaxy formation are typically the roles of these relative effects. You've got galaxies colliding together. You've also got stars emitting heat. You've got stars going supernova. You've got that supermassive black hole and the active galactic nuclei that's around that. What's the most important there? What is going to control the galaxy's shape? Because that will ultimately control the star formation which ultimately controls us. So those are normally where the debates exist. Um, but I don't know of that particular debate that's been mentioned there. It's probably in that mess somewhere. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, next question. How is Japan doing in terms of astrophysics? It's awesome. How could you even <laughs> ask that question? Clearly, good gracious people, come on. Um, I mean, one thing I one of the things I like best about astrophysics is that it's an incredibly international field. This is partly because everything is very expensive. <laughs> so whether you're building a telescope or you're building a space mission, you know, nobody goes to space alone anymore. And nor would you want to. I mean, the questions we're tackling, they're not just affecting you and your neighbor. They're questions that affect the whole of humankind. They're about where we came from. So isn't it right that the whole of humankind contributes to finding the answers to these questions? And also the, you know, the samples that, for instance, Hayabusa 2 will bring back, they're incredibly difficult to collect. They've been incredibly expensive for Japan to collect. You want everyone to look at them because actually you want the best possible results from that space mission. And that is why Hayabusa 2 has an international science team. And it's, um, it also has a, uh, an understanding with the NASA mission OSIRIS-REx, which is going to asteroid Bennu, and we'll bring back a sample a couple of years later. And the two teams are actually going to be exchanging some small parts of their sample with each other. And that's because if you have two samples from two different asteroids, the amount of information more than doubles because you remove the risk that you've just got unlucky and got a very special, unique part of that asteroid it tells you more about what's typical, which is what you really want to know. So having two samples from two different asteroids, it's so much more than double the sample. It's incredible for the information. So, you know, Japan is an awesome force in astrophysics and space science. Um, JAXA is obviously a lot smaller than NASA, but in my opinion, which I guess might be slightly biased, but I don't think so. I think we are doing some of the most cutting edge and exciting space missions out there at the moment. So we're small, but we're mighty. 
and it's represented in our international collaborations with NASA and ESA and ISRO, um, of which there are lots. And you know, this is an international game, and I think we're big players in it. Did you experience like any? This is my question, um, but did, did you experience any like sort of um, downsides of international collaborations? Like, um, were there any difficulties? Um, more of this is what I've heard as opposed to experienced myself. I mean, one of the issues naturally is language. Uh, JAXA still operates a lot in Japanese and the meetings among engineers and scientists are by default in Japanese. So when we, they want to involve the international collaborations, everyone switches to English, which in theory is no problem. Um, the level of English is very good at JAXA. Uh, but it does mean you sometimes end up, for instance, with like two sets of documentations, which is always risky. <laughs> like, which is the master set and which is the... So I think problems like that need to be on people's radar. So they have to watch that, you know, the Japanese and English stays in sync, that um, information is being shared evenly. And also, um, the talking to people at JAXA and NASA, I've realized that the agencies operate quite differently. For instance, NASA is huge. So often there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be set up and done simply because you're running this colossal agency. Whereas JAXA been smaller and people been a little bit more localized. Sometimes agreements can be done, I think, without the paperwork. That's what I was told by Heather Enos, who works for the OSIRIS-REx team at NASA. And she said sometimes NASA would ask for paperwork to show I don't know, X, Y, and Z. And Jax would be like, huh, what paperwork? <laughs> we just told him to do it. What's the problem? <laughs> so sometimes the paper trail is not the same for the two agencies, uh, was what Heather Enos told me. Um, and also, you know, different interests exist as well. So uh, JAXA has a lot of engineers and they really like engineering challenges. And NASA, interestingly, from what I've seen and from talking to people there, are sometimes a bit more conservative. Uh, which surprises me because I would have naively thought bigger agency, bigger risks, but not necessarily. Uh, so I think we do a lot of engineering demonstrations and really cutting edge engineering that features a lot in our missions, which puts a slightly different flavor on them, which is exciting. Thank you. Um, so next question is, um, okay. Um, it is said that matter only makes up uh, a few of per percent of the mass of the universe. Uh, how is that calculated? Sorry, the, could you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. It is said that matter only makes up a few percents of the mass of the universe. Ah. How is that calculated? <laughs> so this is, this is getting a little off my topic, guys. So I apologize if I make a mistake, but I'll do my best and say that um, generally speaking, we divide the universe into three different things. So we have visible matter, which is what you and I can see. Uh, we have dark matter, which we don't know what it is, but we think it is matter, it is atoms of some description. Um, and then we have dark energy. And one of the ways this is calculated is by looking at the effect of gravity. So for example, if you look, you can visually observe how fast a galaxy is rotating and you can calculate how much mass it would take to rotate at that speed. And that doesn't match the visible mass we can see. So that's why dark matter is thought to exist, is that typically the rotation of the galaxy doesn't match the amount of mass we can visibly see in it. Uh, for dark energy, I think it's largely done through measuring the universe's expansion and realizing that if even allowing for the dark matter, which we can make a guess at its magnitude based on galaxy rotations, it still doesn't really balance the forces. So there seems to be something else that seems to be accelerating the universe, and that's the idea of dark energy. Um, I do add the small print that it's been a while since I've studied this. <laughs> so that description may not be perfect, but I think it's generally true. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, through your work as a scientific communicator, what common uh, misconceptions in astrophysics have you found uh, amongst the general public? Oh, this is a question that I feel I could have planted myself, but I promise I didn't. <laughs> so there's lots of misconceptions, obviously, that people have. And typically, I blame the media. <laughs> I 
people really like a good punchy headline and I understand that and I think it is important because it gets people interested but sometimes I think that you know we could be slightly less punchy and be more accurate so my personal annoyance is when you have headlines saying we've discovered earth 2.0 the most earth-like planet ever and anyone who knows me knows that i have dedicated a sizable portion of my life to trying to counter this in the media <laughs> and the problem is what i've really just described at the moment we typically only know radius or mass for planets and venus and the earth have the same radius and mass roughly and while Venus receives slightly more starlight, it doesn't receive enough to really explain its incredible temperature. That is down to its very thick atmosphere, which we can't yet observe. So it may be that we find Venus-like planets on Earth-like orbits. We just don't know yet. So when we say we found Earth 2.0, what we mean is oh, we found a planet that's roughly the same size as us, <laughs> which isn't really what's being portrayed by the media. So I find that a very annoying misconception. Obviously, it's my field, so I find it particularly irritating. But I also feel that the discovery of planets is new. We've only been doing it since the start of the 1990s. And we're on a brink of finding out something amazing. We're on the brink of finding out if we're alone in the universe, whether our planet is unique, whether it's rare. And that's an amazing journey. It doesn't just affect scientists. It's going to affect all of us. And I feel that we have a commitment to bring people along on that journey. I mean, not least because their money is paying for it, <laughs> but also because this will be the story of our generation. And I think everyone deserves to come along for every single step of the way because it's their story too. And I don't think we should pretend we found out what we don't yet know because you ruin that journey for so many people. I don't know why you'd want to do that. So I find that very upsetting because I think what we've discovered so far is fantastic. It does not need to be hyped. It just needs to be explained and everyone can enjoy it. So I write a lot of articles saying we have not found Earth 2.0 <laughs> and I try and explain what we found so far, why it's exciting and what's coming next, because it is coming and we're all gonna be here to see it, I hope. I have a quick follow-up question about the um, Earth 2.0 kind of thing. Um, do you think there is a set of rules in the habitable zone? Right. So that's the main argument for saying why Venus isn't like Earth. Is it's not in the so-called habitable zone. But the habitable zone is a very useful concept for finding another Earth in the sense that based on models, and only based on models, we think that's where the Earth could support liquid water. But if you're not the Earth, the habitable zone means nothing because it's based on the limits of what we think our carbon cycle can control. So the way the habitable zone is calculated is it says, OK, we have this cycle on the Earth where we can take and push back in carbon dioxide to the atmosphere due to reactions with rocks. And we think this will be effective until the inner and outer edge of the habitable zone, whereupon it can no longer change the level of carbon dioxide sufficiently to keep us at a good level. So that's how the habitable zone is, is calculated. If you have a planet that does not have a carbon cycle, the habitable zone is irrelevant. And I can demonstrate that really simply. Mars is in the habitable zone. So is the moon. They're not habitable. So they don't have the right cycles to use our habitable zone. Now, there might be other areas in which, you know, a planet like Mars might be habitable or it might have been in the past but it's going to be different limits and different boundaries for those planets. So the habitable zone is a useful concept because if another Earth exists out there, by which I mean a planet with the same geological processes as our own, and it's out there around another star, we will find it in the habitable zone. Or at least if it's not in the habitable zone, it won't be habitable. So, yeah. <laughs> so therefore, it's really a hunting ground for finding another planet like our own. That is not the same as saying those planets are the only ones where life could exist, but it is a useful criteria because we're most likely to be able to identify life if it looks like ours. So for finding planets that are perhaps the most promising for astrobiological follow-up, I fully approve of the habitable zone. It's very useful for identifying possible Earth-like worlds. But if a different sort of planet is in a habitable zone, 
there's no particular reason why it would be habitable. And there may be planets that are habitable that are not in a habitable zone because they just need different boundaries. Right. Uh, thank you all for your questions. And Elizabeth, thank you for your uh, thoughtful and insightful answers. Uh, no so problem. we would like to wrap up the session. Um, in the comment section, uh, we posted a Google, uh, Google form uh, where we will take questionnaires uh, for the feedback of this talk and for future uh, topics. Uh, so pl uh, please fill them out. Um, uh, in the end, um, Elizabeth, do you have anything that you would like to promote? Uh, I guess actually one thing I would like to say, I don't know what level people are who are watching, whether you're undergraduates or graduates or, you know, you're retired. But I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the last few years is if there's something you want to do, tell people. So I applied to JAXA. They weren't advertising for a science communicator, but I wanted to help with science communication because I loved writing. And so I just emailed them and said, I, I think you have a need here. Would you be interested in, in me helping out? And they said, yes. So if there's something you want to do, tell people. <laughs> right, so uh, SGC is a, is a nonprofit organization or non-governmental organization that consists of students uh, from ages 18 to young professionals up to the age of 35. So it's mainly students and young professionals. And I think that's a really great message, especially for us youngsters who are looking for that big opening in a career. So. I appreciate it. Well, best of luck. I think, yes. Uh, find something you want to do, then find someone who wants to pay you for it. <laughs> <laughs> and that is important as well. <laughs> okay, so we would like to um, conclude uh, SGAC Japan Space Talk on astrophysics uh, with Elizabeth Tasker. Uh, thank you for joining us um, on a Saturday, and I uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You.